Please join with me in prayer. Holy One, we seek your guidance that from the written word and the spoken word we can find your true and everlasting word. Alleluia and amen. Growing up, I spent a lot of time in the Boy Scouts, and at every stage I heard the motto, be prepared. So I learned to have an emergency kit to start a fire when camping, and I, I learned how to turn my clothes into an emergency flotation device, be prepared. And I thought of that motto when Dakota texted over the weekend that he couldn't make church today. I was not prepared, and I, I heard as an accusation the advice of my preaching professor who always said that a, a preacher ought to have two sermons, one in their back pocket and one on their heart. Jay had heard me tell that story, and so he wanted to know, uh, was today's sermon that, that sin was bad or Jesus good? <laughs> Neither, for they don't connect to our lesson from the story of the book, from the book of Acts, and so I ask you to bear with me as we look at Paul's words and to see what they can teach us about leadership. And whether it's good or bad, I'll have at least learned that a leader ought to always be prepared. Throughout the summer, our church has studied the book of Acts, listening to the stories of the first church to imagine how God wants us to be church here in Milwaukee today. And many of these stories follow the adventures of Paul, who started out as an oppressor of the first church and then became a convert and then shared the gospel throughout the Mediterranean. Our reading this morning comes as Paul prepares to return to Jerusalem it's his first time back since he was there as someone who was oppressing the church. So he doesn't know how Christians in Jerusalem will receive him. And he doesn't know what's going to happen when the religious authorities find out that he's converted. So he's very fearful of what will happen. He imagines that he might die and knows that he probably will never return to his friends in Ephesus. And so Paul gathered the leaders, the elders of the church in Ephesus, and our reading comes as the beginning of his farewell speech to them. But the farewell also served as a speech to commission new leaders. In a passage just after our reading, Paul pulled these thoughts together when he said, Keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock, of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God that he obtained with the blood of his own son. In Paul's speech, we get a vision of what it means to be a Christian leader. But before looking at what constitutes Christian leadership, I want to think uh, about the models of leadership in our country today. Years ago, people, um, people describing leaders borrowed a term from biologists, alpha males. And while there are alpha females in the, in the natural world, the term really came from observations of male chimpanzees and wolves. Newt Gingrich actually popularized this metaphor. As Speaker of the House in the 1990s, he gave freshman congressmen copies of the book Chimpanzee Politics. He wanted them to act like alpha chimps. And men do certainly get themselves into all sorts of silly competitions for dominance that don't seem much better than chimpanzees. I, I can see that at those photos from the, the G7 uh, uh, gathering where Donald Trump and Emmanuel Macron were in a handshake war. But also in moments in my own life. Years ago, I got a chance, thanks to Holder, Heather Olsvik Lumens, to go uh, hear President Obama speak at, about the Affordable Care Act in Green Bay. And I was going to be on the stage behind the president. So I got there early to make sure I got a good seat. And I picked out my seat, and I, I knew where the president was going to sit, stand, and I, I could see where the cameras were, so I, I got a great seat. And then other people started coming, and one of those other people was, was State Senator John Ehrenbach. And he looked at me and the cameras, and he said, could you move over? <laughs> I was not going to move. And so he, he kept moving into my personal space, trying to shove me over, but I, I wasn't moving. And so we, we were in this shoving match between us, seeing who would get the prime spot. And, and when the president arrived, I was there over his left shoulder, and John Ehrenbach could not be seen. But beyond those absurd moments, there is a model of alpha leadership in our country that looks to chimpanzee and wolves as models of how to be dominant, a strutting alpha male who makes other males act subserviently. And really, this meant a leader who beat up others, barked commands, asserted dominance, and made everyone know who was boss. Really, a bully. 
And this metaphor of the alpha leader continues to bounce around our culture. Lots of books and articles evoke it when talking about leadership. A recent essay in Forbes did so under the title, How to Lead Your Team Like an Alpha Wolf. And it advised the readers on ways to dominate their competition, competition kill other predators, and organize their hierarchical pack. This model of leadership is gendered. It reflects a, a mistaken view of masculinity, the, the idea that men can be praised for being dominant, but women dismissed for being domineering. Which is why I wasn't surprised to learn that the author of this Alpha Wolf article runs a financial services company named Patriarch Equity, as if the patriarchy needs more equity. It seems to me that too often the model of leadership in our culture embodies a hyper-masculinity, a bravado of dominance, which is why Paul's farewell strikes me as important and very different model of leadership. A number of phrases stand out to me as I listen to Paul's words. You yourselves know how I lived among you, serving the Lord with humility and tears, enduring trials, not shrinking from doing anything helpful, and now, as a captive of the Spirit, imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. This is not the vocabulary of dominance. No business book in America advises CEOs to anticipate a future of imprisonment and persecutions. Yet Paul uses this language. He got, did not speak of his dominance, but his captivity, captive to the Spirit. Jesus spoke of this kind of leadership, too, at the end of the Gospel of John, where he said to the Apostle Peter, Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and, make you, and take you where you do not wish to go. Christian leadership doesn't mean projecting dominance, but being led by the Spirit of God, even, it's, even if it's to where we do not want to go. Interestingly, the, words, the word leader echoes this sense of being guided by the Spirit. Leader comes from an old English word, lithan, which means to go. A leader is one who goes. Leadership consultant Robert Diltz observed about this, it is significant that the root word of leadership does not have to do with power or command or dominance. It has to do with going somewhere together with others. It's not so much about being number one as it is about leading the way through one's own actions. Paul pointed to his own actions in Ephesus his leading through humility, tears, and service. This description of Paul reminded me of something the biologist Franz de Waal pointed out about chimpanzees. As someone who studied chimps in the wild instead of just using them as a metaphor for CEO bullies, de Waal called attention to all the things alpha male and alpha females actually do among chimps. Our stereotype of the alpha male chimps suggests that they get and keep their position by being the roughest, toughest chimp in the pack. But in reality, even the strongest chimp can be taken down by the other chimps working together, which means that strength isn't the key. Instead, alpha male chimps get and hold their position because they demonstrate generosity and empathy to create a stable coalition. The chimp that wants to become the alpha shares food Everyone gets something. Even more importantly, the alpha chimp and the alpha male or female demonstrates empathy to more vulnerable members of the group. Chimps often fight. The, they'll, they'll get into to screeching matches, even uh, come to blows with one another. And an alpha will arrive and separate the two and intervene. And the alpha almost always intervenes on behalf of the underdog. This makes the alpha popular because the chimps know they can get protection. Beyond this, the alpha chimps console the stressed members of the group, hugging them just like we humans do. The alphas actually give more consolation than any other chimp. That is, the alphas demonstrate the highest levels of empathy in the group. The generosity and empathy of alpha chimps allows them to form coalitions within their group, 
coalitions which enable them to become and remain alphas. The more they engage generosity and empathy, the more sta stable their leadership will be. These are the same values that Paul pointed to when he spoke of his humility, tears, and service. How would leadership look different in our society if we focused on generosity and empathy instead of dominance and power? The full implications of Paul's vision of leadership come out in the last verse we heard today from Paul. I do not count my life of any value to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify to the good news of God's grace. To my ears, Paul has shifted from generosity and empathy as a strategy for winning friends and influencing people to self-sacrificing service as a way of life. And he spoke to this not only here in Acts, but in many of his letters, such as when he wrote to the church in Galatia, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. I know he didn't always succeed at this, but Paul tried to set aside his ego, which he called being crucified with Christ, so that he didn't seek out his own glory and honor and power. Imagine how our politics and society might look different if our leaders let go of their egos. This was Paul's journey. Paul had Roman citizenship at a time when everyone around him struggled on as undocumented residents in the Roman Empire. As a citizen, Paul couldn't be tortured and crucified. So everyone around him faced really unspeakable, inhumane acts if they were arrested. But Paul knew the worst wouldn't be done to him. And this citizenship actually protected Paul when he did get arrested in Jerusalem. Paul held status and wealth and power, but he knew faithful leadership called him to continually let go of his privilege and position. Not everyone's path to faithful leadership involves letting go of their ego. People who have been marginalized and oppressed don't need to make less of themselves. Where Paul needed to experience his ego crucified with Christ, others may need to experience their, dig their dignity resurrected with Jesus. Some may need to let go of their privilege, others to claim their dignity. Which may be why Jesus said that in his kingdom, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. How would leadership in our society look different if those with privilege and power sought to be crucified with Christ, if those marginalized and oppressed sought to be resurrected with Jesus, if we all made a way for Christ to live in us? Paul raised these questions with the church in Ephesus because he wanted them to become leaders like him, to excel in generosity, to strengthen their empathy, to make sure Christ lived in them. In short, to be prepared, no matter where the Spirit would lead them, to be Christian leaders. Alleluia. Amen.